Police have identified four victims and plan on more than just the four murder charges filed today. I just want, if this were a classroom and you're listening at home or wherever you're at work or whatever, uh, I want you to show of hands, how many of you out there love to watch uh, true crime documentaries or, or listen to them like you are? Obviously, you know, now you're a true crime fan for whatever reason, but we all are, <laughs> we all are into this, right? Yeah. And, uh, I have both arms and both legs up. There you go. That's <laughs> cheap. <laughs> but, but I just want to know by show of hands, because... How many of you out there also can listen to it by yourself? Does that freak you out, kind of? Um, you know, I've watched a few crime shows on the on the, on the TV by myself, and I I didn't get freaked out too much. So, so, yeah. so, you, oh, go ahead, Gabby. Yeah, I, I'm capable of doing that. I mean, I always enjoy watching it with somebody else just because it gets more interesting. Mm -hmm. But I can watch it alone i was used to that actually before i met matt i would watch all the true crime by myself okay well i'm, gl I'm glad you brought that up so so gabby you're you, were you ever in bed late at night you know kids asleep watching you know a true crime documentary just by yourself yes okay so picture this though picture a younger gabby about 21 no, <laughs> but you're, you're just a year ago. I'm still 21. Yeah, you're you're 22. That's what you are. A year ago, 21. Uh, but let's just let's just uh, pretend that Gabby's uh, Gabby's in bed right now. She has her big screen in front of her bed. She's watching a true crime episode. Maybe a little popcorn there with some wine before she knocks out. And uh, you're like, wow, this case is crazy. Oh man, you know, like he's got him down in the basement. Oh, that sucks what, what he's doing. Hey, wait a minute. It kind of looks like my basement. And then you zero in a little bit and they start talking about certain things. You're like, wow, that killer has the same kind of dining set that I have upstairs. And then all oh, of a sudden, heck no. wait and a then all of a sudden they show the address of the house and it's your house. What? Get out. <laughs> that happened to a person in our story tonight. Wait, wow. what? <laughs> yeah, that happened. Um, and we'll get to what happens with her later at the end of the story. But basically, that's how this one starts out. She <laughs> found well, out. If that had been me, I'd have been on the in the car already, speeding <laughs> at that place. Yeah, you got to ask me what I would have been doing. <laughs> yeah, Matt would have been gone. <laughs> the first <laughs> the first sign. <laughs> He's like, run. Is that a six on that door? Yep, I'm gone. Let's go. <laughs> See, as as Matt leaves the house, I'm, I'm a white guy. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like let me go investigate. I walk in as he walks out, as he runs out. I'd be one foot in, one foot out. Yeah. Go with Todd, investigate. Run with Matt, save your life. He's all, hell no. <laughs> you're going to see white smoke. That's all you're going to see. I'm gone. <laughs> but, this is, but this is what happened. And uh, we're going to go to uh, Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, and this is where it's located at. It's uh, a little east of St. Louis, Missouri. So... <clears throat> St. Louis, Missouri, Ferguson, Missouri, Ferguson, uh, little details on this city. If you're outside the United States, it's, uh, you know, when you have whatever you want to call it goes down, um, between the police and, you know, the black community, uh, it sometimes could be hostile, uh, in this town, there's been multiple shootings that have been iffy or not iffy to choosing on who do you believe or, or the evidence that's presented, They've had riots there. It's been just, you know, really racially divided area of Missouri, unfortunately. Mm. Um, back in the day, that used to be mostly a white town, but they had a white flight. And now today um, it has 18,000 residents and 67% of them are black. So it's a heavily black area, um, but they have four times the amount of crime of the national average, the police have been either defunded or there's just not enough of them. Um, you know, it, unfortunately it's just, it's a bad situation. Makes sense. Yeah. <clears throat> but we're going to, but this is the state of where it is now. Um, it was a little bit better when, when this story takes place uh, over 20 years ago. 
Um, but uh, we're going to talk about one Maury Travis. Maury Travis. Um, Maury Travis. Yeah, you ever heard of him? Sound familiar? No. Okay. Sounds like a rapper. <laughs> yeah, he sure does. <laughs> <laughs> or or someone that tells you you're not the father or you are the father. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. You are not the father. <laughs> then you hear the rap music and the guy's dancing. <laughs> so, yes! <laughs> I told you! And, and somehow somebody, she's running point. somewhere. <laughs> yeah, she's on the she's on the ground with her weave like that. Oh, it's already back at the chair. You know, she's in the backstage area. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the Maury Povich show. Um, so, uh, th- we're going to talk about Maury, uh, Travis. He was born, uh, October 25th, 1969 in St. Louis, Missouri, the, the city itself. Um, he grew up in a housing development with his two, uh, with his mom and dad. Uh, the thing is with him, there's just not much known about him other than the friends that he grew up with and the cousins that he had, uh, the, f- the mother who's still alive to this day. Um, doesn't provide too much information on his childhood. Um, all we know is that he was really a sweet kid. Uh, no head injuries that we know of. Um, no killing of animals. No wetting the bed. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. this one's this one's a bit different. Definitely. Yeah. Um, his parents were divorced at the age of thirteen. That's like the worst stuff that we can get out of him before his high school and college years. Dang. So there's not too much right there. Um, but pretty every, much any typical person, you know, pretty much. Yeah. He's a, just a regular John Doe. Um, uh, the only thing that they said that he was a really sweet kid, really sweet, young adult. Um, very nice, very respectful. Um, never got into trouble. Uh, you know, if a, if a old lady needed help crossing the street, he was sort of that boy scout type of kid. Like uh, he had a good reputation in his, in his city. Or, or at least in his town. Um, is that the first story we've ever done where somebody's this normal? Uh, it's one of the first. Yeah, I think I think we may have done one other one, but but this but this guy was more squeaky clean than the other one for sure. Dang. <clears throat> yeah. So um, he gets he graduates high school, not assuming he's not a valedictorian though. He's not like you know four or nothing like that. But he's a good kid, so there's no issues. Mm-hmm. Um, he actually gets uh, into computers in 1987 through 1989. Um, he's going to Morris College, which is just outside St. Louis. So he's got himself a uh, paid for scholarship because, you know, our academic scholarship to the college. And he's learning about computers when, it, when computers were just breaking onto the scene. So if he follows where he's supposed to go and he graduates, you know, this guy could be, you know, a millionaire later. You know what I mean? Like he's getting in at the right time at you know when technology starting to take off mm-hmm. but what's one thing that you think derailed him finally mm. either girls or drugs <clears throat> gotta I'm, pick one gabby i'm gonna <laughs> say girls i'm gonna say the drugs especially in the 80s wait matt, no this is 90s matt called it though Damn it, I had it too. You you had it, yeah. <laughs> I was waiting. I'm like, which way is she gonna go with this one? So drugs. So what 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 drug do you think got him? Cocaina. <laughs> <laughs> right again. <laughs> now how did he do the crack? He sprinkled some it. crack on it. <laughs> <laughs> the what? He sprinkled some crack on it. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Nah, he's like, that's far too easy. I'll just smoke it instead. I'm going to say he shot him with the needles. Nice. He smoked it. He smoked it. Oh, yeah, he smoked stopped crack. it in the line. Because smoking crack's really addicted. addicting. You he know, was on the cracking. He was on the cracking big time. Mm. Um, <laughs> he, he, he actually dropped out of college, unfortunately. He was two years in doing really good. Um, he got addicted to smoking crack through some kids that were in his dorm and, uh, he uh, couldn't, what a moron <clears throat> two years in already and you're going to drop out. Yeah. And he was, he was actually doing really good in his class, like really good. Um, he began to have to feed his need. I mean, obviously he had a part-time job going to college. He can't afford much crack. His crack habit got up to $300 a day. 
Dang. Every day. For back then. So think about that. You're talking Dang. early 90s, like around the 90, 91 time. And he's got a crack habit of $300 a day. Damn. Yep. So he began to rob, as you do. You got to feed the need. You got to feed the habit. And um, he went out and he started robbing people, stealing cars, trying to just come up with any kind of money. And he got the brilliant idea, as most crackheads do, uh, not to purchase a real gun, but uh, purchase a plastic gun and uh, just take off the orange part, paint the rest black and, uh, you know, rob some places. So he began to rob, you know, shoe stores, you know, Mm. try to steal Nikes and, you know, pawn them or whatever you got to do. And uh, he robbed five of these stores and uh, the cops finally got him on the fifth one after he had had made some big come ups and they arrested him and uh, he was facing a good, you know, nine to ten years per robbery because although it was a plastic gun, it still was an armed robbery. And, you know, how how the people supposed to know, you know, it's traumatic. That is true. Yeah. So his defense was the crack made me do it. (laughs) <laughs> do we have johnson's and the johnson's were all all right <laughs> but, <laughs> like he's not guilty <laughs> no but they, they were they, the judge was like you know what we're you know he was he was willing to go the you know wanting to teach the kid a lesson but at the same time maury had a good reputation prior to the drugs so the more that his public defender was like, hey, you know what, look at his re- resume before the drugs. You know, he didn't know he was doing what he was doing. And his, his uh, keep this in mind for later, his um, public defender uh, wrote the local congressman who sent a letter with a stamp and, and it was official letterhead of the Missouri um, City Council congressman type thing, mm. uh, stating that he knew um, his mother Sandra and he knew um, oh. Ma- Maury yeah <laughs> Sandra's the name um, or <laughs> <laughs> and he knew Maury and uh, he said <laughs> you guys are bad uh, <laughs> I didn't say that <laughs> <laughs> he said that uh, I know these two and this family's nice and Maury's a good kid give him a chance you know so he wrote this big letter to the judge and uh, he had it stamped and uh, the judge was kind of impressed by that. <clears throat> so instead of giving him the max per armed robbery, he gave him three years per robbery that totaled him at 15 with the opportunity of parole if he was on good behavior, possibly within eight years. Hmm. <clears throat> so you would think, you know, he got really, really lucky, you know. So at this at this point, you're like, OK, you know, he has. He can go one of two ways. He can get worse, or he could turn his life around and take the break that he got. Do do as much time, you know. Do as try to get out a little early, but do your time. Be a good behavior, and get out and change your life. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, he doesn't start off that good. Um, no. Yeah, he starts writing the judge that just gave him a lenient sentence that life in jails in bear. Uh, unbearable he can't handle it uh you know there's rapes that he's witnessed there's beatings uh there's all kinds of like illicit activity going on uh the guards are beating the inmates um people are taking advantage of others in different ways and he's like it's ugly here like i want to commit suicide just to get out of here please help me out you're the only one that uh that can help me and so he wrote this long letter to the judge and what do you think happened he overturned it. I'm going to say the judge looked at that letter and threw it in the in, the, in his files or something. Nah, Gabby got this one. <clears throat> what? Yeah, he only got five years out of the 15. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so that's with like, you know, that's like the least amount. Like, like that's the most he could take off, basically, the judge helping him out. So he... He gets him paroled at the age of 28 in 1994. So he only does five years and three months in jail. Not bad. Yeah. Now, can he take... What happened? 
I love jacked up. It's jacked up because the judge wants to help this person pleading for his help, but this person terrorized others. Mm-hmm. He didn't help people. He traumatized them. He threatened them. And he just gets... Like, people are compassionate toward him, but he wasn't compassionate when he was trying to grab his fix and yep. terrorize others. Yep. Now, now here's the part that's going to make you upset again after you know what happens later on in the story. Mm. So it's, not, it's 1994 right now. He just got a huge break. Uh, he goes to a culinary school because the prison had helped him out. In the, you know, he was working the kitchen in the prison. Um, so he learned some skills there. And then the, also, you know, after you get paroled, sometimes these, these um, programs are there for the inmates to get them readjusted to society again they'll help him out with a trade so he took his what he learned in prison and then also <clears throat> took it into a um a, a i hope home. they don't eat i hope they don't eat his food <laughs> <laughs> well see this is not one of those though matt but i like the way you're thinking oh but, okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he wasn't cooking up any kind of testicles yeah or boy prison food, man. I'm trying. okay go, go on <laughs> No, he um he actually got into some good restaurants and some you know like he 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 um was working as a short order cook, and then he started working as a line cook in various restaurants, kind of bouncing around, making really? some hours. Yeah, he he was starting to come up a little bit again. Did he go to Le Cordon Bleu? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Cord- Cordon Bleu with some uh, what is it called? Uh, little string beans and mashed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> some plastic forks um oh. <laughs> now nah, but he, uh he was doing all right uh but seven years um there's a little gray area um he was doing some uh not always kosher things um he was still dabbling with drugs although he he wing you know he was off of it for a good while but he started to get back into crack again and then he started to have to do some things and that's why he was bouncing around because he would have a hard time holding jobs because sometimes he'd go mm-hmm. on benders miss a miss a couple days or even a week and they'd fire him you know so hey. he even he even <laughs> getting more breaks he would get arrested for you know violating parole either being caught um trying to buy drugs or solicit prostitutes and uh you know the judge was like hey i told i thought i told you stay away from here and then he's like, <laughs> all right. And then he's back and then he comes, gets arrested again. He's like, hey, what did I just tell you? And then the guy's like, guy's like I'm sorry. He's like, all right, and lets him go again. Like, they, wow. <laughs> it was a revolving door. He kept getting, violating probation and got just sent right back out. Interesting. Yeah. So um, he, um, he began in, in early 2000 to have uh more prostitutes actually come to his home now so he's he's uh he's he's like i don't want to do this prostitution stuff on the street let's start bringing them home and uh Mm -hmm. he ups it by saying uh if we're gonna have sex in my house since we have private area let me videotape it so he starts videotaping him having sex with uh various prostitutes and women of the night um and you know hey if it's consensual if you paid for it there's uh, right here he's not committing no crimes right here i mean you know in a way you know what i mean like like he's not on the street stuff like that you know yeah. he's uh, bringing the work home i guess um <laughs> but uh, but he's up in the game as he goes about it you know what i mean like it goes from like consex- consensual sex regular sex to like uh weird fetishes to bondage so he starts like you know he you know how it is like you just can't uh-huh. um yeah he's he's just he's uh continuing to do his thing basically so uh in 2001 um he has a prostitute over the house and um he has consensual sex gets a little rough um but there's where things change uh during the videotape um he begins to hit her and then he uh, wraps uh, duct tape around her eyes, which has got to freaking hurt. It's yeah, that's got to hurt. Yeah. Um, he bounds her legs and also her wrist. 
<clears throat> and he drags her naked body while she's alive down to the basement. Um, he, he didn't then... try to fight him off. Huh? He didn't try to fight him off. Uh, no, he because he hit her to stun her basically. Yeah, yeah and oh. she's bound. Her mm-hmm. legs are bound. Yeah, he takes her down to the basement and um, he starts to um, what is it? Uh, berate her and talk crap about her and tell her, you know, uh, just just things about her family and her, and her choices. So here's a guy who's made terrible choices over the last few years, including his incarceration and with drugs and everything, and he's trying to tell someone to fix their life when he's just is screwing their life over in front of their eyes. Blind leading the blind. Yep. All the while, while he, when before they, you know, got into this predicament where he's got her tied up, they had smoked crack. So, who's he, who's he to talk? You know, who's he to talk? Yeah, and uh, so he ties her to that pillar. There's there's a, there's a basement, and uh, it's pretty. I don't know the dimensions of it, but it's a pretty big basement under this house. And there's one pillar that holds up, you know, part of the roof that's right in the middle of the um, basement. And he's got her tied up to that. Her hands behind that. He rips the the tape off her freaking eyes and hair. And, oh. I just hope she didn't have real eyelashes on because goddamn that would have hurt. Um, Oof. Yeah, and, and eyebrows. Uh, but this woman is only 19 years old. Dang. And, and uh, he would videotape himself on, again, and this is going to be graphic, uh, just torturing her with various, um, you know, utensils or sexual toys, but not in a good way. And uh, also him having sex with her as she's tied up to that pole. And wow. um, after he's done berating her one more time, he um, strangles her until she's not breathing. And then he looks back at the camera and says, it's the wedding day. It's my first kill. And he smiles. Wow. Yo. Yo, this guy is crazy. Yeah, and the wedding day <clears throat> reference is the ta- the videotape back then, the VHS, um, was a, uh, the first hour of the video is actual videotape from a wedding. I don't know whose wedding, but um, it's labeled wedding day, but that's his first rape and torture. So, yeah, yeah that's very tough. Um, she was 19 years old, and I say she was 19 years old without a name because... To this day, way back then, we still don't have a um, name to the victim. Was she the Jane Doe? Yeah, she's a Jane Doe, and um, her body has never been found. So, what? Yeah, we we can't we can't freaking uh, even test the the bones or anything to try to do a you know reverse genealogy or anything else like that. She's missing mm-hmm. still. Um. So, as his crimes would continue against women, um, there would be more victims that would be tortured with beatings, stun guns, um, you know, knives, like stabbings while they're still alive, you know, mutilation. Um, He would berate the women on these videos that would say, what's wrong with you? Why would you get into a car like with a guy like me? Because he would pick him up in his car. Mm-hmm. Um, your family's not going to miss you. What are you going to say to your kids? Tell the tell the people out there you're sorry. Tell your family you're sorry for letting them down. That you're a piece of you know. He's what just bastard. yeah. He's torturing these women mentally as well, and he's telling them that as the as he has them for and it's 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 not like he's getting them for a night or two, guys. He's he's got these women for at least a week at a time. Until, huh? Dang. Yeah, until he's tired of them, then that's when he offs them. But basically, see, these women buy themselves some time, but do you really want more time if you're just the end result's the same? Because I mean, it was hope. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's true, but he's asking them to say every time he does something to them, no matter how vile it is, whether it's making them eat food that they shouldn't be eating, stuff like that, or 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 doing you know sexual acts 
um, they have to say, if it pleases me to please you, master, yes, please, I want more. He, Are you kidding me? Yeah, they call him master, um, just everything. Um, he even told one woman, who's watching your kid right now? I've seen pictures of your kids in your wallet. And then she says, uh, your grandma, and he laughed and said, well, it's definitely not you because you're not capable of capable of it, you whore. Whoa. Damn. And your, and your kids will know that they had a mother that was a whore. Stuff like that. Can you believe that? Yeah, you... like the physical pain's not enough. Yep. And he's down there telling them, look at you on your back. This is a quote. Look at you on your back, the cracked out whore that you are. While your kids are worried about you, you don't give a crap about them because you're just too busy smoking crack and giving it up like the cheap whore that you are. When like 30 seconds before that, he's smoking crack. He's smoking crack. <laughs> yes. So uh, a, little, yeah, a little hypocritical, don't you think? Uh, so this one, um, he he uh, his first victim is finally found in April 1st, uh, 2001. Two months after um, Alyssa Greenwood, which was the um, prostitute, she was found rotting in a ditch outside of Ferguson Highway, just outside the town. Mm. <clears throat> she she was the one that he that had the kids that he was berating on the video. Mm. Um, his next w- woman, uh, his next victim, um, she was uh, when she was younger, when she was seventeen, she had her first child. Um, she she was smart. Went to went to uh, college though. Tried to better herself. Mm-hmm. But as she did, she kind of followed his sort of background. Uh, he, she couldn't make it in college and take care of her daughter, and with no husband or boyfriend to help her out, mm-hmm. um, she began to get into drugs. Drugs led to having her do prostitution, and she would lose um, what is it called custody of her child. Um, so the next, you know, 19 years after she had her kid, she only had her kid for a few years before CPS took the kid. Mm. And, um, you know, 2001, she would make the mistake of running into Maury, getting into the car with him. Um, the two would smoke crack. They, uh, relaxed. Um, you know, she thought everything was good, um, after consensual sex, but then he repeated the, the, the steps that he did with Alyssa and beating her and and doing everything vile he held on to her for four days before he strangled her on the video i wonder where this is coming from i i mean like yeah like out of it just seems like i mean obviously he was already on the drugs but it seems like out of nowhere where he just suddenly snapped and decided to kill somebody because like you said earlier there's not much to speak on his youth when he was younger but all this built up violence had to become from somewhere. Yeah, and unfortunately, like you'll find out the reason why we don't know too much, but you know, because we've had, you know, it's the same thing that happened with Vaughn Greenwood, you know, like uh, that story that we just put up on YouTube. Um, revisiting that case, you know, there's not much about his pre, you know, his early days, you know, because mm-hmm. he just he became mute. He doesn't want to talk. And then mm. his, his family, you know, he, he hadn't been around his family in years, so you don't have that connection. They don't know him. He left when he was a kid. And then this guy, um, his mom won't talk, you know, about about certain things. Like, she's she's been off the radar. So, you know, you really don't know. And he never talked. So. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's just weird. All they have is what they found in evidence. That's it. Yeah, there's got to be more to him. Mm-hmm. I don't think a person who does that good in life and if, like starts your life that well is gonna end up like that, unless yeah. the drugs really, really, really messed you up like that. I mean, it could. I mean, you guys think? Do you guys think that it was like a, like sort of like you know how Popeye gets his spinach and he gets his strength? Do you think crack <laughs> was just like, well, I'm gonna make you murder now? I mean, like or torture? I mean, was that was that his like go to or or? Do you think I he mean, did this high, like not high? I don't think so. I think I think he 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 smoked one crack pipe and it got him so high that he was looking for that high every time, and that was like his his uh, spinach, so to speak. If either of you ever smoked crack, 
what's it like? Like the feeling, can it make you do something like that? Yes. Write us in the comments if you smoke crack. <laughs> <laughs> Leave a comment if you if you got. No, I mean, you know, Max told us that he tried it. Once. I, I've tried it one time. I, I didn't smoke it, but I, I took a lie, and uh, I'm not gonna lie. It made me feel invincible. I felt like nothing could stop me, and I only took a little bit. Wow. So, for someone who's an addict, yeah, he's probably he's probably Superman in his in his mindset. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, I remember you telling me about that. Like, like yeah, I mean, that was just a little bit. I can imagine. It was just a little, like I just a little snort, and I, 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 the effects of it, like within thirty minutes, I was just like, yeah, I feel like I could stop a bullet. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if he's spending $300 on his crack, yeah, that man is Black Adam, Superman, and Batman combined. That's how. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's, that's a little more than a bump, dude. (laughs) Yeah, that's his mode right there. So anything will set him off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess I guess that's the only thing we have to go on is maybe, you know, the drugs made him do it type deal. You know, it's just a bad combination with certain people and certain personalities, I guess. Yeah. But, and some, some people, you know, they lace, they, they, they lace their drugs. Yeah. So who knows if he was taking something else with it. That's true. That's true. We just, we just know the crack aspect. We don't know if there was any mixture. You're right. Yeah. But, um, in this case of Teresa, um, they would not find her right away. Uh, he he um, he disposed of her body in a vacant lot outside the city. And in the areas of Missouri, uh, Ohio, Michigan, there is an awful lot of condemned houses and vacant lots where people don't venture out to for quite some time. Yep. And they would not find her her body for forty five days. Jeez. Dang. Yeah, and she was thirty miles apart from the other unidentified woman so well he throws them in random places in random places yeah and oh so these were her her remains were picked apart by the weather and by small animals so there's just like there's nothing left there's no dna to go off of because this is in dna's like initial stages they could take hair samples blood samples and stuff like that bone but this, this was just, like early 2001, right? Yes, yeah, 2001. So, mm. yeah, you can't, uh, you just can't find anything at this one. The only way they were able to identify the body, though, is on her. She had these, uh, I guess, a, a de- these dental, these dental um, implants that mm-hmm. actually had a serial number on them. And so when they traced, yeah, when they tra- when they traced the serial number, then it came back to Teresa. So, interesting. Yeah, it's the only way. It was a, like a dental plate that was keeping her teeth in place. So, probably lost her teeth. Yeah, she probably it was sort of probably like a bridge, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um. So with her being identified, um, you know, there was two right there, and the police weren't. Uh, you know, there was a lot of Johnsons at the at you know beginning of the story. You know, mm-hmm. with, you know, in the legal system, not too many in the in the police department as far as. Like they just, again, we've talked about so many other stories, even in the early 2000s, whether you're white, black, Hispanic, Asian, and if you're a prostitute, you're just not valued as much as the white suburban woman, the black inner uh, inner city woman that's got a good job, uh, you know, the Hispanic uh, model, whatever like that. Like you're just not valued like that. You're a prostitute. Really? Yeah, prostitution it kind of weakens your your status and it's unfortunate but the you know these women go missing and the police really don't still to this day in some areas don't take it as serious as they should agreed yeah the thing is though he was out on parole wasn't anybody checking him no because what he was what he was uh he he had violated parole several times and in a high crime area like ferguson there's just not enough parole um agents or whatever you want to call them to 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 keep these guys on track you know 
Um, I think maybe they failed him too, where they didn't put a device on him. They didn't have him with an ankle monitor. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in the story does it say he ever had one. So that maybe they should have had an ankle monitor on. Yeah, he should have been on house arrest. He was a model citizen when he was younger. That's that was his. They banked him on that. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. They they pretty much took him for what he was twenty years prior. Um, so now at this point though, here's a here's a problem. Between Ferguson and St. Louis is not a big, you know, uh, distance. They start to find bodies every six to ten days at this point. Oh, oh. wow! Yeah, per you know, they're starting to find, and then when they're uh, starting to identify them, they're like, "Well, she's a prostitute. She's a prostitute." And some of the bodies they can actually find out what they died of, and they're finding on a few of them that there's stun gun marks. There's whippings. There's, you know, like the, the person's been whipped. Obviously, the the final, the, the cause of death has been broken windpipe or neck strangulation. So they're, mm. they're finding out, you know, there's ligature marks. These women are not just being killed right away. They're, they're, they're being tortured. So now the police are like, hey, uh, you got a case. I got a case. We all got a case. This is a serial killer. I don't dig it. I'm like, What? <laughs> Wait, they're all what? excited and then freaking <laughs> yeah yeah they're all excited and then, then dr phil's like hey guys we gotta take things slow and work this case out you know and and then they just they, they start a task force you know they, it's they start... too much how much you sound like him <laughs> why you gotta bring dr phil in this man leave him alone he ain't done nothing <laughs> dr phil is the new character in our cases okay yes yes <laughs> We've got to work these cases out one by one. <laughs> so they, they, they put them all together and uh, they start working these cases out. And then, you know, like uh, they're like, yeah, there's there's definitely too many, uh, too many freaking uh, what's what's it called? coincidences. Yeah. So they're, they find up to this point, uh, they have five already, but uh, they also would tie in another four. So they would have nine. They would have nine murders at this time. That they would Man. nine bodies. Nine. <laughs> yeah. Lord. So what happens here now is something that uh, on my birthday, on my twenty first birthday at the time, uh, <laughs> September eleventh happened. So. Yeah. Yeah, and so they were finding bodies up until September eleventh, and then it, everything stopped. Like uh, they stopped finding bodies. Um. The police were actually thinking that, uh, you know, maybe he um, joined the military, you know, because three the task force is there and three months go by and there's just nothing. There's no abductions. There's no kidnappings. There's no beatings uh, because some of these women were getting beating a beaten and they were um, saying it was the same guy like like like, hey, this there's a black man, bald head. You know, he's uh, but that could be anybody, you know, in the area. Sure could. That's how they described him? <laughs> yeah, not much to him other than he's like a thin build, black man, late 20s, early 30s, bald head, goatee. <laughs> it's like Where did they get that from? Well, that was his description. That was from some of the prostitutes he would beat and that would get away, you know, or or that he would uh oh, l- let man. loose because there was a few of them he did torture in different areas, not his house, and he'd let him go. So, um, so again, the, the, the police thought that he was, he was, you know, pro America, America, and he fought, Mm -hmm. he fought the cause, but, uh, you know, he didn't, he was arrested finally on, uh, breaking probation and, and drug, uh, drug allegations by soliciting uh, prostitutes as well. And he was trying to buy drugs. So he got two counts and he was thrown back in jail. Um, so he would do six months after, you know, for, for the, uh, you know, for the, the violations and whatnot. And here's another break that this guy got. So uh-huh. it's frustrating. So obviously, I think it was the mid 90s. They required all inmates, you know, nationwide that if you commit a felony, you had to get, uh, or late nineties, you had to get your DNA, your blood tested or not blood tested, but mm-hmm. they have to sample your DNA yeah, mm-hmm. to put it in the system. Right. Mm-hmm. 
So he had felonies galore, and he should have gotten his DNA taken. He was never swabbed. Never swabbed. Get out. Not once. So he's just going in and out like a freaking, you know, restaurant or 7-Eleven and... <laughs> it didn't register to them like, okay, we've been holding this guy for this much time and it was for prostitution situations too. Maybe he's the one that killed all these prostitutes. Yep. They didn't even... <laughs> Oh, that guy's such a nice guy. Let's let him go. <laughs> that was it. So, yeah, they, they let him go, and uh, that could have uh, saved a few people. Let's just say that. Um, So now you're talking, you know, it's almost 2002, um, and, and, you know, there's still, there's still pe- uh, people are going missing now again because he's out. Or it Ooh. is 2002, I'm sorry. People are going missing now. And a reporter from the St. Louis uh, Dispatch, Bill Smith, would write a letter because he was troubled the fact that you had all these, um, you know, black women that were prostitutes that the community just didn't care about. And and uh, he's like, I'm going to put a story to Teresa. You know, I'm, I'm going to talk to her family. I'm going to talk to her kid and her kids now because she would have been a grandma. Mm-hmm. And and we're gonna we're gonna um, do a profile and make sure that the people in St. Louis know that these victims, uh, you know, Teresa was a woman, was a person, had a story other than a prostitute. I don't want these women to just be called prostitutes. And he was being critical of the police, and he was also just telling a story. Mm-hmm. So he met to piss off the police and get public awareness for these women by humanizing them but what he did was he grabbed maury's attention so uh maury would uh would read the article and uh he would write a letter to the st louis post dispatch which is the newspaper what yeah yeah maury would write a letter and uh he said uh he said nice letter about uh maury or about Teresa." I really appreciated that. Although you didn't have to uh, make the horror out to something that she's really not. Um, Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He said, um, if you want to know more, I suggest you write a letter about a better woman. And that is uh, one of my other victims, Alyssa. One of the other body that you found. That's jacked up. Yeah. And he put his name on that. No. No, I don't think he. Would. He did not. He did not put the um, uh, the name on it. But what he did do, he put the is, victim. Yeah, he he said, uh, if you want more information, write that that column. So Bill Smith did exactly what he was told. He wrote that column after showing it. You know, he kept the letter, and, he, and then uh, after writing the column, he's like, dude, I, you know, like I'm going to tell the police about this, which he did. But he said, uh, if they if the guy writes back, you know, he should have more intimate details. Because the police were like, well, you could have read that there was another, you know, that Alyssa and the other one were in the newspaper. So I'm not going to take this too seriously. So the cops all, huh? What did Dr. Phil say about that? Well, Dr. Phil was like, there's no need to rush to judgment, people. Let's just take our time. Remember, take our time one case at a time. (laughs) And uh, they they really just sat back and, and... waited for the next letter so the next letter came after he i guess approved of the Alyssa column because he wrote another nice column about Alyssa. Mm. um he wrote a detailed letter down that had a map and it had three big x marks and he's like um you uh he goes one of these x marks has my 17th victim on it and if you go there you'll find it Mm. 17th so the police so many yeah so the yeah but here's the thing the police were like wait a minute we only got nine like they're counting their hands all they're like i don't have 17 fingers (laughs) billy come over here let me start counting your fingers because we got one three five (laughs) seven two nine we got nine dead bodies i don't know where the other one 
two, seven, <laughs> three. So, yeah, it took a while. Once the math was finally done by the FBI who came in at this point. They figured it out. Yeah, they figured it out. They're all like, um, Johnson, that's 17. You have nine. That would be eight. Whoa, whoa slow down there, young buck. Slow down. I, we do things a little different over here. So it, that was just a whole nother conversation. But once they finally put figured it in, play it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but once they figured that out, they realized, okay, let's go see where the X on the uh, map is. They found it, and lo and behold, they found a which is described here, a bleached skull. Oh wow. Yeah. I mean Oh was he like Dahmer? Well they couldn't tell if it was by him or it was the elements. But the body had been out there in the vacant lot again for quite some time. And it was like either sun bleached or he bleached it with bleach. It was that white. Like like when they pulled up looking where the X was on the map or on the GPS mm-hmm. and they looked out in the field, it was bright. It was like it was staring right at him. A skull. Oh, he was going to make sure they found it then. Yes. Yes. So they would find scattered bones of that body around um and that body would not be uh, identified too, so hey. uh, for for a while. Um, they took the letter and they saw that the the um the stamp was upside down. It was the American flag with the twin towers on it, and um, the return address was a hardcore porn site, which was called uh, Thraldom. Whoa, <laughs> yeah. So that was a bondage hardcore porn site. They investigated the porn site. They realized uh, they had nothing to do with it. Um, They tested the envelope for DNA. Nothing there. Um, So you're thinking, man, when's this guy going to get caught? Mm -hmm. How's this guy going to get caught? Um, The FBI got smart. Um, On the paper that he included in the newspaper, which was the map, they Mm -hmm. realized in the corner it was... Um, it had numbers on it. And when they looked up the numbers, they figured out it came from Expedia.com. Expedia.com. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, for the hell of it, the FBI contacted Expedia and was like, hey, man, can you track these numbers that are on the top of your, you know, because we got this printed picture and, and it's probably the killers, you know. And uh, lo and behold, Expedia was like, yeah, we can. And with our help oh. from our partners microsoft so they got a subpoena and uh you know a month later they went to microsoft microsoft came back with the information they said hey that uh we need uh what do you guys need and they said we need uh any kind of expedia references or or people looking searching this area from this time to this time (laughs) and wouldn't you know it there's only one person that did wow and it was Maury Travis who they wow. tracked, they tracked the- down by his email. <laughs> wow, not that smart then, huh? Yeah, and his email should have been something like, like with our with our emails, you know, we got some funky names, I'm sure, for your emails or whatever like that, you know, like you know, I could be like Doctor Phil at Yahoo.com or whatever or something stupid. And uh, this guy was just like, "Hey, I'm Maury Travis. You know, might as well just put Maury Travis Killer at Yahoo.com. You know." <laughs> Well, it's a good thing he was that stupid. Yes, that was his undoing. That was literally his undoing. Um, and this is before torrents and all those other sites that can help block your IP address, you know, because that's how you can block your IP address. Because that's how some people are like, oh, man, the UK has better um, Netflix stuff than the US. And I'm in the you US. Do? Well, yeah, you could. They have different programming. So that's- you can. You can uh, disguise your IP address through a torrent and uh, and through other different VPNs and whatnot. And you can um, pretty much, or IP vanish type of stuff like that. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. promoting these guys for free. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you can say, it, it'll say, oh, he's in Australia or he's in the UK or he's in, or people in the UK can watch US programming by doing that. Huh. So, yeah, there's They're a not- way. Yeah, so if this if this guy you know waited a few years because I think that started coming around 2007, then he would have got away with it, basically. Until he's 
until he slipped up somehow. But on June 3rd, that's when they got the information, 2002. Four days later, uh, the police SWAT team and FBI showed up at Maury's house and uh, pretty much interviewed him on the spot all day while they searched and processed the house. That's where they found um, the videotapes. They found um, stuff that, you know, Polaroid pictures of women. They found um, uh, blood all around in the basement. Um, They found uh, women's clothes that did not belong to him. And also uh, just a lot of mementos that he kept, like little trophies. Wow. Yeah, and as they're investigating and talking with him, he's trying to keep the control of the interview. So he's trying to, like, you know, take the interview the way he wants. Um, He's even getting upset with him because his cat's roaming around. The detectives keep petting it. He gets very uncomfortable when they're petting the cats. They notice that he flinches and he kind of, like, shakes his leg. And then the the detective's like, here, you want your cat? He's like, yeah, keep your creepy hands off my cat. And they're all, uh, keep, for real? Yeah, they're all, keep our hands. creepy hands. They're the ones with the creepy hands? Yeah, exactly. What the hell's wrong with this guy? <laughs> yeah. So it, it, so what what the scary thing is here, now picture, picture this. Picture you're the detective, right? One of you guys is a detective. And you're interviewing this guy face to face. And you've just found like videotapes and you haven't watched him yet, but you found these Polaroids Uh and you lay them out on the table in front of him. There's 20 of them. And you're like, do you know this woman? And he's just like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. And then you get frustrated and you take the pictures and you kind of put them on the side table after you, you know, put them all together as one stack. And then he looks up at you after he's, he keeps looking at the pictures and then five minutes goes by as you're asking him about something else. He says, let me see those pictures of those dead women again. <laughs> That's a clear sign. Exactly. And what do you say as a detective? I never said those women are dead. Uh, I said, exactly. do you know those women? I uh, Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then right then and there, he's like, <laughs> I want my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he checked he's out right then and there. Up. He screws up, and then it's time to uh, cop out and act for a lawyer when you screwed up. Yeah, because right there, he just lost control of the interview. He wanted to dick these guys around as much as possible, and the moment he messed up right there, the cop had him. He's like, I'm shutting down. That's it. So. If I'm not cop, I would have looked at him like, yep, I'm in control. (laughs) Yeah, and then he, but here's the thing, though. Right when he said, I want the the um, the lawyer. lawyer, he goes to get a ride to the prison, and then he starts telling the lead detective, hey, I'll show you where the other bodies are. And they're <laughs> like, really? Okay. So they start, wow. they start driving towards East St. Louis just for him to say, nah, nah, it's all right. Never mind. I'm good. Take me to prison. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they kept begging him. The cops and the FBI were begging him, like, look, there's a lot of damage done here. It would look really good on you if we can close these cases, give these families some some uh, closure. And he's like, well, I don't want the death penalty. And I know if, if I go, <clears throat> I'm probably going to get the death penalty if I release some more. And, and they're like, look, we'll do whatever we can not to get you the death penalty. You know, I'll, we'll put in good word, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's trying to save himself. And uh, he's like, I don't, you know, I want a good prison, you know, and they're trying to work deals with him. They're like, we'll, we'll put you in a good pus- a prison away from um, other inmates. We'll give you this. You know, they're trying to get him to just help these people out, and he won't budge now. He's, yeah. he's done helping. A-hole. Exactly. So uh, to wrap this up, he goes to prison, and uh, the FBI has their agents – you know, wanting to interview him, but first they have the doctors check him out, psychologists, they want to make sure that he's not going to be a threat to himself. And although the the doctors and the psychologists say he's no threat to himself, he, he's all about self-preservation, he wants to live, you know, the, the police are smart. They're like, hey, you know what? Nah, we don't believe it. This guy's, you know, he's probably at some point going to break. You know, he, he didn't like prison before. Let's put him on suicide watch, right? Uh huh. And you think, okay, he'll be fine till trial. We got this guy. Oh no, he killed himself. 
Bingo, Gabby. Bingo. Damn it! <sighs> this is one of those those things where you say you had one job. Damn it, Johnson! Like <laughs> little suicide watch. Yeah. So you have in in the St. Louis jail or prison where they had him, you had basically an inmate slash guard watching of the inmate. So you have in 15 minute intervals, whether the dude's taking a shower or not, whether he's playing with himself, uh, playing G.I. Joe, whatever, you have someone watching him, whether it's a guard or an inmate. For some reason, there was a 30 minute gap that the, the guard and the inmate missed their scheduled um, rounds. So that's he had, all. yep, that's all it takes. And he had 30 minutes to take his sheets, time around a vent, tie it around his neck. Now, this is a part that gets sketchy. He put toilet paper up his nose. He shoved toilet paper down his throat and tied his hands behind his back. What? That's how he was found. How can he be tied and hung himself? I have no idea. I'm trying to figure this out too. That's the twist. Yeah, I've never, I never, yeah. I, mm. Like, why would you need to tie your own hands? Well, oh, okay. Oh, and he had toilet paper up his nose as well. So, I'm yeah, trying to figure out what, what's the toilet paper? Unless he's trying to. What you know, I'm plug saying his... is that he's he's just trying to make sure that he's he's not going to react once he's like choking to want to undo it. He's going to die. Like he's not going to get a change of heart and he's going to suffocate himself either way. I just don't get the behind his back. How do he do that? How did he tie his arms? I don't know. And and, and here's, here's the thing too. He already had a penned out um, uh, suicide note saying that he apologized to his mom. His mom was the best thing in his life. He ruined his life and ruined hers at the same time uh, to not blame herself for everything. His dad's a piece of crap because the dad left when he was young um, and that um, he's sorry for um, committing all the crimes that he did. Um, Not sorry to the families, but just sorry that he got caught, basically. Sorry we got caught. Yeah. And um, so this this guy was going to rot in jail and get the death penalty either way. They had him linked to uh, several murders via um, DNA. And plus the videotape had him. You know, and then they were still pissed off about the rest of the bodies because to this day, uh, they're they're he copped to 17, so that means there's eight bodies out there somewhere. And uh, but they have 20 women via on Polaroid or on video, so they think at least there's 20 women dead. Mm. It could be that some of those were the ones he let loose, that could be too. I got away. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also theories that maybe he just said that number to make himself more popular because he was narcissistic. Um, there's also uh, to this <laughs> to this day right now they still will they went back and forth and I think it was just a couple of years ago um, they tried to uh, again sue the city because they feel that it was an inside job someone killed him. So his uh-huh. family's his family. I was gonna say that maybe that inmate did not miss his rounds. Could be. That's that's the thing that the the, the family of him is, have been fighting. But I think the city's just like screw him, dude. He was a piece of trash anyway. Maybe they took him out, but then it doesn't make sense because they still wanted information about him. They wanted to see what made him tick because we don't know what made him tick. They never got the opportunity to. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So the going back to the beginning of the story as we wrap it up, 2014 was when our our uh, woman here was watching the story of her own house, <laughs> and 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 uh, what there what happened? Yeah, Sandra the mother had leased the house out without telling anybody, so she had tenants after this, and she's like, oh yeah, come down, I'll give you a discount, you can stay in the house for this much. Never told her about the. Uh, <laughs> the issue here. So when she confronted her, she was even more surprised to realize that was Maury's mother and that she didn't give a crap about it and was holding her to the lease. So it took a year of her fighting 
the um, the uh, what is it called? The housing board and Sandra mm. in court to get herself released from the lease because it would have been a huge uh, penalty if she were just to jump the lease. Mm-hmm. And this woman had two small children of her own, and they would all complain after they found out about. Now, again, you could choose to believe this or not, but after they found out about the killings and everything, they started to hear voices. Uh, the daughter started when she went to the basement. She stopped going down there to play because she started to see visuals of women being tied up to that pillar in the middle of the basement. What? Yeah. So you could take that with a grain of salt. Could be true, could not. But that's what they were experiencing. It was freaking them out to a point to where at the end, before they got the lease broken finally, legally, that they were actually staying at other people's homes because they were too scared to stay at their own house. I mean, anything is possible, but it's also possible that the mom had the kids agree with her so they can get out of the lease faster. True. Yeah, True, or that was just playing with her head once they found out. So. Yeah. But that's yep. that's a case. Say it clear. You are the master. They're pleasing me to serve you. You are the master. That pleases me to serve you. You are the master. Please me to serve you. Now you sit your ass down like I said. You sorry? Yes. You sorry about what? Everything. Jumping in the car with a mouth you don't know. Huh? Yes. You saw it? Yeah. Uh-huh. You want to say something to your kids? <laughs> mom, sorry. Who raising your kids? Me and my mom and dad. You ain't raising shit. You on here in your back smoking crack. Because you ain't going home, mom. I'm going to keep you about a week. This is first kill, number one. First kill was 19 years old. Name, I don't know. I don't get it. First kill was nice. It's bad enough just to listen to the sounds of terror. Take the tape off again and see what happens. It's a scene straight out of Silence sure. of the Lambs. Because you ain't going home, Mom. I'm going to keep you about a week. This is first kill, number one. First kill was 19 years old. You want to say something to your kids? <laughs> mom, sorry. Who raising your kids? Me and my mom and dad. You ain't raising shit. You on here in your back smoking crack. You ain't going home, mom. I'm going to keep you about a week. 